I love when stories that, you know, we've been covering and we've been leading the way on because the stories are happening right in our backyard become national stories. And that's right. exactly what happened yesterday, John. It's great. We should have a segment that's called Stop Me If You've Heard This Before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's so good. I mean, I, I knew it was going to happen. It was just a matter of when. Because the story perfectly bisects the worlds of politics and pop culture and celebrity and everything else. But uh, yesterday, I'm listening to KCMO here on 95.7. And I'm listening to our man Ben Shapiro open up his show at uh, 2 o'clock. He's on after Dan Bongino and he's on before the Ramsey show. And I, I, I wondered when Ben and some of the other national hosts were going to start doing this and chiming in on the whole Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey political conversation that's happening right now. Are they going to come out and endorse Joe Biden come this fall? What's going to happen? And, you know, listen, I've been banging this drum for the better part of a couple of days now this week saying it is beyond stupid for anybody on the right to be concerned about Taylor Swift, to think about Taylor Swift, to attack Taylor Swift. It makes you look small and petty. Oh, and CNN loves it. Oh, they are digging it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are having a field day. Thanks, Vivek. Yes, exactly. So Ben Shapiro starts talking about it on his show, and right out of the gates yesterday at 2 o'clock, he says more or less what I have been saying for the last 48 hours. Yeah. It, they're like, if we can get the 34-year-old lady who sings songs like she's 17 years old and breaking up with her first boyfriend again, and she's like two years younger than my wife, who's a doctor and has four kids. If we can get that lady to endorse us, then magically we are going to win the election. If Republicans just stood there like, why? How desperate are you? That is a much better attack than what we have seen instead, which is a bunch of people on the right going, it's a, it's a PSYOP. It's a Pentagon PSYOP. Everything's a conspiracy. Exactly. That, that, how about a... I'm going to give Ben a slow clap. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Oh, I I never know. You know, I mean, not that if he disagreed with me, I would have felt differently. But Ben's always, I believe, a guy that's pretty um, clear minded in his thinking. So when he started mentioning the name Taylor, I'm like, oh, where's he going with this? Where, Where is this going? And then he takes it in the exact direction that I've been talking about it from over the last couple of days, which is one, it looks wildly pathetic for people on the right to be scared. Oh, oh my goodness, here comes Taylor to save grandpa. How weak do you think your side is right now? How weak do you privately believe Trump is if you think that Taylor Swift is going to get this vegetable over the hump again in 2024? She got 35,000 people to register to vote with her 280 million Instagram followers when she put out a registration drive. Not saying, you know, Republican or Democrat, but she did a voter registration drive on her social media pages and got 35,000 people to sign up. That is nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yet the conspiracy theories continue to run wild. And listen, I love a good conspiracy theory. You can talk me into one. We can converse on one. I find them entertaining, John. But this one, this is the this this makes people on the right look nuts is what it does. Uh, I'm an original member of the KISS Army, now retired, but I may have to go on reserve here, right? <laughs> Time to reactivate, brothers. Dog whistles. Come on, let's go. <laughs> KISS Army, reactivate. Give me your best stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the world that we find ourselves living in right now. It's like, guys, let's take a deep breath. Let's take a step back. And let's also realize what Ben Shapiro said yesterday, something else that he said yesterday which is the celebrity endorsement thing usually doesn't work unless the candidate themselves is the real celebrity. The Democrats have been trying to play this game for multiple election cycles in a row. Barack Obama did not win in 2008 or 2012 because he had celebrity endorsements. He won because he was the celebrity. It is one thing for the candidate themselves to be a cele- Donald Trump won in 2016 because he was a celebrity. Pop cultural relevance does matter an awful lot. 
but only when the person with the pop cultural relevance is the politician himself. It is non-transferable credit. If you stand next to Taylor Swift, that does not make you Taylor Swift. And it does not give you the appeal of Taylor Swift. That's exactly right. You know, I remember a day back in 2016 when Hillary Clinton, the night before the election, was in Philadelphia and rolled out Beyonce, rolled out one of my favorite, my all-time favorite musician, Bruce Springsteen. And, I mean, that was going to be the thing that got Hillary over the hump. It didn't. And there were others there as well. But I remember Beyonce and Springsteen. And, you know, it looked great on TV. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it was well produced. It was slick. Here's the, you know, top music stars from the current generation, from the prior generation, all trying to get Hillary Clinton over the hump. Not only did it not get her over the hump, she did not even win the state that she was in that night, Pennsylvania. Barack Obama had a lot of celebrity endorsements. But Barack Obama won two elections because he was the celebrity. He was the star. He was the one who was compelling, who was interesting, who whether you like him or or don't like him, he was the one who people were drawn to. Not the celebrities who were hanging around him. Because if that was that easy, well, Hillary would have ran away with it in 2016. They broke out the same model, but one thing we learned in 2016 is that the celebrity status of the candidate themselves and the popularity of the candidate themselves matters a whole lot more. So some folks on the right have taken two incorrect approaches here. The first incorrect approach is being afraid of Taylor Swift. That's number one. As Ben said, just let it roll off your shoulders and be like, wow, how desperate is Joe that it's January before the election and his people are already dropping rumors about trying to get a Taylor Swift endorsement. Like, that's pretty pathetic. This is not September, October. We're talking January. And they're lacking such confidence in themselves and their re-election bid that they're already dropping nuggets about Taylor Swift. It's really pathetic. But instead, the right's freaking out over it. And then the other thing they're doing that's a massive mistake is thinking that going to war with Taylor Swift, who's a likable, attractive, very popular pop star, who, yes, happens to be with an all-American, middle America dude in Travis Kelsey, is somehow a winning strategy for them. So it's like the left's doing something very dumb. They're showing their own weaknesses. They're showing their own hand. And then some on the right are like, hold my beer. I'll make us look even more pathetic and desperate than you guys. But they can, then again, this is what our politics has devolved into. Stupidity and pathetic people looking for clicks and likes and quick pumps of adrenaline through their Instagram pages and their X pages and their Facebook pages and their TikToks and things of that nature. Because it's not actually about the movement. It's not actually about the American people. It's about themselves. It's about their egos. And that's one of the reasons that we find ourselves in the place that we do today. And it's sad. And we all end up losing as a result. But now you're seeing our local story here in Kansas City get more national by the day. 913-408-7957. It's 613 as we get this show rolling on a Wednesday morning on KCMO. We are going to announce our next Politics and a Pint In just over one hour at 7.30, our guest will be here. We'll give you the date, the location, and obviously who it is. At 7.35, it'll be our first event of 2024. And we'll announce it in an hour and 20 minutes right here on KCMO Talk Radio. And plus, an all-American brand is still trying to buy you back. We'll tell you who and how next. This was the uh, headline in Rolling Stone Yesterday afternoon, Trump allies pledge holy war against Taylor Swift. In one of the dumbest political strategies of all time, if it does come to fruition. Now, remember, Trump really has kept pretty quiet on this whole deal. Remember when Trump, he he chimed in on Truth Social once about Taylor and Travis. And he said something like, basically, I wish him well and hope he doesn't get hosed or something along those lines. As I recall, it was much to do about nothing. It was pretty harmless. And it's really not even 
Donald Trump himself who appears to be going down this road. It's the people who are desperate to be in his inner circle and or stay in his inner circle who are making this Taylor Swift thing a much bigger thing than it needs to be. They're the ones. Not not Donnie himself. We haven't heard a peep from him. Now, doesn't mean we can't by, uh, you know, 7 o'clock this morning. But we have not as of 620. But the people around him who are just uh, desperate to kind of get in as part of the MAGA in crowd, they're the ones who are making and, 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 and being the loudest about this issue. And by the way, John, a lot of Kiss Army fans are on the text line right now. Just so are you know. Are they ready to get back into it? They are sending in the memes. we and got the, weekend duty coming up. Yeah, <laughs> they are all fired up, man. Uh, Steven is in Kansas City. He's on KCMO to kick it off on a Wednesday. What's up there, Steven? Happy hump day, big fella. Wow, Pete, man, AFC champions, and they just did 30 minutes on Morning Joke about Travis Kelsey. I feel like I'm in, like, Bizarro World or something, man. Did they Did um, they, they? just did 30 minutes on Kelsey on MSNBC? Is that right? With, without without commercials. With 30 minutes, on, they'll probably replay it at 8 o'clock. Did with, they, uh, about did, Travis and, and Taylor. I mean, this is like bizarro world. Did, did Listen, they bring on uh, old, Claire, I, old Claire McCaskill for a little cameo? No, 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 no Claire in her kitchen. I All love right. I love Claire's backdrop. I get to look at her kitchen the, for, for 30 minutes. All um, right, what's your point? Here's what I think's going on here, okay? That Newsweek poll came out and said that she could sway 18% of the of the young vote okay this is a close election this is not a regular endorsement this is like the rock you know endorsing someone or going to campaign uh permanently for you this is i i i don't think it was the greatest thing for the trump spokeswoman to kind of put a shot at taylor saying that she she has plenty of songs about choosing bad boyfriends so she shouldn't choose a candidate this is a warning shot across the bow you know, I, I don't think Travis is going to win MVP and then propose on stage at the Super Bowl and then and then endorse Biden. I think this is a this is a concentrated warning shot. And then, P, you were very correct to say that Donald Trump has not weighed in on this whatsoever. But the, the they're they are very worried that she has endorsed Democrats before. And I think it's legitimate that you could kind of put this warning shot out there and say, look, do you really want all the smoke? Do you want, do you want Donald Trump full bore at you, your, your, your incredible career? You know, you're the top of the world, and do you really want to get involved in this? Now, this is what, that's what I think is going on here. And Travis, you know, leave, leave Travis out of this. I don't think he cares about, you know, any, I don't think he does stuff. either. I don't think he cares about the, the vaccine stuff that much. So I don't think he does either. That, I think, that, uh, Stephen, you're, we're on the same page. Uh, yeah. Great call. I, I think that, you know, I, I, that Travis is some, you know, uh, deep conspiracy man on behalf of Big Pfizer. No, I think he took a big old fat check. I think that's what Travis did. And I think that's that. Now, you can disagree with that, but I think he just took a big old check. You know, he enjoyed his fame the last 12 months and got unbelievably wealthy off the field with it. I think that's all it was. I agree with you there, Stephen. I think you're right. But, you know, the whole Taylor thing, I, Trump's got to stay away. There's no benefit to him in attacking Taylor Swift. I saw Scott Walker this morning. Remember him, the former governor of Wisconsin? I donated to that schmuck's presidential campaign back in 2015. I had a buddy who was working on it, and he was calling all his friends. And, you know, I wasn't anything that was going to break the bank. But he was working on the campaign, and I gave Scott Walker back in 2015 money for his presidential campaign, one of the great flameouts in recent presidential history, and he's, like, going after Taylor and Travis. It's like, when are, when are guys like Scott Walker um, going to realize they do nothing but hurt the cause at this point? Like, they're trying to be hip and cool on social media, and it's like, dude, you're doing the antithesis of that. Got to get with the times, brother. It's just pathetic. But when it comes to, you know, I I get it. Every vote counts. Close election. Let's get Taylor involved. If anything, here's more of what I think might be happening. The media is building up this whole idea of Taylor Swift potentially endorsing Joe to try to pressure her into doing it. 
not because the rumblings are actually all that great. We know Joe would love it, but they want to pressure her. You know, listen, she is cream of the crop. She'll be the face of the Grammys this weekend. She's the biggest pop star on the planet. And the who's who folks in celebrity land in D.C. and Hollywood and in those circles are trying to pressure her through every means possible. Now, I think Taylor, and this is just looking from afar, is at a very different point in her life. I'm seeing someone on TV on Sundays who is loving playing the supporting role of her love, Travis Kelsey. She is loving being around Jason Kelsey, who's ripping his shirt off and chugging beers and jumping into the stands with Buffalo Bills fans when it's 30 degrees outside. She's embraced that. And everyone talks about what Taylor did in 2018 and 2020 during election cycles and things like that. I I mean, think back to yourself. Late 20s, mid 20s, impressionable, incredible fame, incredible wealth. Well, five, six, seven, eight years can make a big difference in someone's life during that period of their lives. Taylor looks like to me somebody who is finally comfortable in the spotlight and doesn't really care what other people think and what they're going to say. And she's not seeking others' attention. That's just my 35,000-foot view of it. And that leads me to the conclusion that she will realize there is no benefit to her in getting political right now. There isn't. Especially, you're going to hitch your wagon to this guy? To to this, this guy in the White House? This ain't Obama, okay? And I'm hopeful that hanging around Kansas City for just, you know, the last couple of months and being in this part of the country for a little bit, also maybe indirectly through osmosis opens up her eyes just a little bit to how the rest of the folks in the country see the world. She's not, she's been, you know, here arguably more than she's been in New York and L.A. And maybe in part, how about this? The media is worried that we're rubbing off on her. So let's try to get her in our corner rather than be afraid of her and then try to rip her. What brand is trying to build itself back up? It's an iconic one. We'll tell you who next. One of the all-time great American brands is still in survival mode and trying to win you back. And they're going to try to win you back in a big way coming up at the Super Bowl in a week and a half. Good morning. It is so good to be here on a Wednesday. And uh, we are going to announce our politics and a pint guest one hour from now. Be tuning in. It is our first one of 2024 and I believe our first one since the summer. Since we had Mayor Lucas do one of these with us. So it's been a while. We're going to have a bunch this year. We're looking forward to it. Of course, it's going to be a busy year. Uh, with a Missouri governor's race and so many other things happening. Uh, Do not miss that announcement one hour away, plus Dr. Jordan Peterson. We've got those tickets, 7.15 this morning in about 40 minutes. He's going to be at Cable Dahmer Arena coming up on Friday, February 16th. So uh, by now, we're almost a year into what we know has been a brutal stretch for Bud Light and Budweiser at large. Well, they are all set to try to win you back as they have bought a couple of minutes of ad space across three separate slots that will air during the Super Bowl on February 11th. They're going to market their top beer brands, Bud Light, Budweiser, and Michelob Ultra. It will feature sports stars, the Clydesdales, and humorous characters from prior ad campaigns. It's like, guys, you overthought this. It didn't have to be this way. But you decided that it was time to go down the road of normalizing the bulge, dude. Normalize the bulge. We are normalizing the bulge. Give it to me, Mark. Normalize the bulge. That's pretty good. He's going to normalize the bulge. I can't tell the difference. I... (laughs) We got a regular Dylan Mulvaney on our hands. I've heard this too many times. (laughs) Yeah. It's been a while, though, and normally at 6.37, your voice may not be fully up to speed, but, man, you're ready to roll at 6 a.m. I like it. I'm ready. Anytime you need me. All right, Mark, you have earned your pay for the day. Head on home, my friend. Well done. Go take care of that baby. Um, 
So they are going to bring back the things that made them successful over the last, you know, 100 years. The Clydesdales. I mean, I was looking at the story this morning before coming on the air and just thinking about the last eight, nine months for Bud Light, Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch as a company. And I sat there and I said to myself, this was all so avoidable. Anheuser-Busch was a beloved all-American brand. Now, I know it's owned by a company overseas now, but still, the perception was, I mean, it was as American as apple pie, Bud Light, Budweiser. And through one social media campaign, one stupid social media campaign by an ad agency based out of New York that has no idea who the people are who actually consume their product, they have set themselves back in millions of dollars in market share, and now they're trying to win people back by having to buy millions and millions of dollars in advertising during the Super Bowl. Not that they wouldn't have done it anyway, but they're running three to four different spots throughout the Super Bowl. So I was thinking back to some of the great Budweiser commercials that have run during Super Bowls in the past, and, you know, I, I mean, I could have gone the old route of the frogs, Bud, why, Zer? Those are always funny. But nothing stood out to me like the Clydesdales. I mean, that is just quintessential Budweiser. And this commercial in particular mixed the Clydesdales with the funny, with the storytelling, with the emotional in a beautiful way. Since I was born, I dreamed of being a Budweiser Clydesdale. Only problem is, I was born a donkey. So all my life, I practiced the Clydesdale walk and the Clydesdale pull. I even tried hair extensions on my lower legs. And then came my big interview. They looked me in the eye and said, what makes you think you can be a Clydesdale, son? And what was my answer? I must have said something, right? That's 20 years old now, by the way. I don't want to make you feel old, but that commercial is 20 years old. 2004. To think that that brand, that's now 148 years old, threw all their goodwill away for a trans social media influencer will remain one of the all-time biggest blunders in marketing history. If we ever have an education system, a higher education system that properly teaches kids things they need to know. This will be in every marketing 101 class in this country. You know, I think of the movie, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, How to Destroy a Brand in 10 Days. Bud Light, of course, figured it out. And now they have to win you back, John. I was just thinking that the title of the book would have the, uh, you know, How to Destroy a Brand, what, it's subtitle, Here, Hold My Beer. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yes. (laughs) So uh, some of the numbers here from this Fox Business article, The fallout continues for Bud Light. Their sales, we haven't talked about them in a long time, but they're down 17% year over year per their latest earnings report. That's Bud Light. Now, at the apex last summer, they were down 25% or so. 30 was on the high end, but 25% was a safe bet. So they're still down significantly from a year ago. And on top of that, late last year, Publishers Clearinghouse Consumer Insights surveyed 5,000 people and 54% were aware of the Dylan Mulvaney campaign misfire. And here they are almost a year later having to dig themselves out or try to dig themselves out of this hole by continuing to run ads, this time on the Super Bowl. And they're going to go back to what worked. Clydesdales, frogs, all-American characters i mean that's what works and it's what worked for them for 150 years and they threw it away in a heartbeat for something that was completely avoidable uh one of the all-time misses so i'll listen one of my favorite parts of the show the day after the super bowl is talking about the commercials 
and getting to run back some of the commercials. So if Budweiser has a great commercial, I'm not saying I'm running out and buying Bud Light anytime soon, but at least it's something I'll share with you, and I think it'll be fun to follow. 913-408-7957. That's our text line. That's our studio line here on KCMO Talk Radio. It's great to be uh, back with you on a Wednesday. Our Politics and a Pint guest is coming up in 45 minutes. Plus, we've got Dr. Jordan Peterson tickets a half hour away. Don't miss it on KCMO Talk Radio. Coming up next, uh, the president has plans for February 3rd. Very important plans. I'm glad he's doing this. I will wholly admit I'm glad that he is doing this on February 3rd. It just broke. I'll tell you what that is coming up on KCMO Talk Radio. Normalize the bulge. We are normalizing the bulge. After sleeping on it last night, I get more excited about the prospect of the Royals looking at this downtown site where the Kansas City Star building used to be. Number one, because I have to stop looking at that building, which is never a bad thing, and thinking about all the awful journalism that came out of that building for so many years. Uh, But more importantly... For us, the taxpayer. Now, I know and I understand some of you at 705 are screaming at the radio. You're screaming at your Alexa. You're yelling at me through your iPods as you're listening on the KCMO Talk Radio app. I don't want to leave the K. And I feel the same way. I don't either. But sometimes you got to just understand things are going to happen and... Barring something wildly unforeseen, we can't change that. Now, I suppose you could vote no on extending the three eight cent sales tax in April, and maybe the Royals go back to the drawing board. But if they're going to move, suddenly that downtown loop site is very appealing. Yesterday, we had on Tony Private Terra. He's the guy who owns uh, the building there where the old Kansas City Star. Uh, location was on the south side of the loop and it would be just south of t-mobile of course sits right between power and light and the crossroads district and we talked to tony about that location in particular and as a guy who obviously wants the royals to go there for very obvious reasons um here's what he had to say about that location um so i think that is the million dollar question all right is an entertainment um district needed to go along with the royal stadium yes but it exists we've got it it's the crossroads it's the power and light district it's the new park that's going over the highway right there we've got all the makings of an unbelievable scenario for a ballpark also connected right to the t-mobile center you can't ask for a better location now you may say well pete why do i care about you know rich guys getting richer Well, my goal here from day one has been to limit the amount of taxpayer dollars involved in this project. You can't make it zero. I I know like our friends at the Show Me Institute, they're the Missouri-based think tank that we talk to on Wednesday mornings. We'll talk to them at 830. I know that they're always dead set against it, right? There are no public dollars for anything to do with arenas and stadiums. And I agree in principle But then I realize and I wake up and I notice that I'm in the real world. And they're going to get theirs in some capacity from some taxpayers, whether it's in Kansas City or Nashville or Austin or somewhere. They're just going to get it. I mean, that's the way of the world right now. So how do we keep them in Kansas City while limiting the exposure to the taxpayer? And this does it. And it does it for a couple of reasons, because I don't see how the Royals, there's not room. If they go to the Kansas City Star site, there's not room for the entertainment district that they have desperately wanted since this whole process started. But they don't need an entertainment district. There has been no demand in this town for another entertainment district. Power and light doesn't make money. It's not a profitable operation. It loses money every single year. You, the taxpayer subsidize power and light so if the royals were to move their ballpark to the kc star building and it helps power and light that helps you the taxpayer that means that less of your money is going into the sinking fund that is power and light district and it also helps a lot of small businesses who are sitting there on the crossroads who have had a very tough go of it really since covid right 
I mean, that that whole area. Now, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of places in the crossroads that are doing really well and are doing great. But you know as well as I do, just generally speaking, it has been a tough few years. So if you're able to put a ballpark there, you help local business in crossroads, you help power and light, you make it less reliant on the taxpayer. And also the Royals no longer build this entertainment district that they've wanted for so long. I don't see the loss. I mean, the loss is still Kauffman Stadium, which a lot of us understandably don't want to see go anywhere. But the loss is much less if they go to this location than if they go to the East Village and they want this $2 billion complex that includes commercial real estate and restaurants and bars and then another billion dollars on top of that for the stadium. That's ridiculous. And there's no need for it there. I mean, this East Village isn't even a thing. It's just a made-up location near a bunch of homeless shelters anyway. So this feels like it's mitigating the loss for the taxpayer. Free Market Frank is on KCMO on a Wednesday. What's up, my man? Good morning, Pete. As a, as a, 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 a guy, or actually a couple of my wife and I love going to the Crossroads, uh, our favorite restaurant down there, a fair, we'll, shameless plug there. Anyway, uh, if, if this whole thing develops into improved entrance and egress from that whole area down there, that's a huge win for the city because the, that, that whole access question, that area stinks. It's just horrible to get in and out of. Yeah. Uh, now, as a free market guy, though, based on your caller nickname, are you accepting of some taxpayer monies? being used for this but trying to limit the damage which is basically my my goal here and what makes the most sense as far as i can tell well just just from the standpoint that that's missouri tax dollars not kansas where i live you know that i guess that's the answer right <laughs> well now you're being a wise guy what about if it all right no play. no 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 yeah, you being a wise guy. Uh, you too. Have a great day. And uh, you got your plug in there for your favorite restaurant in the crossroads which i guess if we're all going to start going down that road Well, I could do a whole show on that. I don't want to do that. But um, listen, the question is, if tax dollars are going to be used, how do you effectively use them in a way that benefits everybody and limits exposure to the taxpayer? And I think this does it. Now, on the text line, Pete, what about the church? They want money as well. Yes, there's a church there that's expanding as we speak that's going to have to move and go somewhere else if the royals are serious about that location. I asked Tony Privatera, who owns the Star Building, about that yesterday. Here's what he said. Well, you know, you have to treat people right and fair. The planning of that particular project was a long time ago. It might be unfortunate, but, you know, you have to take care of people correctly. And you do it by being creative, and you also do it monetarily. Okay, so money talks is what I'm hearing. That's how things work. Yeah. All right, I'm not... I'm not talking about doing anything other than paying people what is right and maybe overpaying and making people feel good about being part of the team. All right. That was Tony Privatera on the show yesterday. So he's in charge, by the way, of trying to buy out the church. The Royals are not going to do that. That is going to be something that would be done on his dime. So he's going to basically try and buy out the church and move that church, and then get the Royals to basically buy the property from him to build the stadium. That's the process here. And the Royals have said by the end of February, they'll have an answer on all this, and I think that's what they're waiting for. If they wanted to go to the East Village, they would do it by now. I don't think they want to be there because it's no man's land in the downtown loop. So now they're just buying time. It's the same reason I drew the conclusion over the last couple of months that North Kansas City was out of the mix. Because they had every opportunity to say, you know what, screw Jackson County, forget downtown, we're going up north. And they never did it. Their silence told us all we needed to know. And right now their silence tells me they don't want to be in the East Village. They want to be at the old Kansas City Star Building, but they've got to figure out how to make that work, and some deals have to be done to make it happen. 20 minutes away from our next Politics in a Pint guest, our first one of 2024. We will be announcing it right here on KCMO Talk Radio, our guest, our location, our time. Don't miss it at the bottom of the hour. 
Uh, but right now, we got those Dr. Jordan Peterson tickets. He's going to be at um, Cable Dahmer Arena Friday, February 16th. Tickets are still available, but right now, your chance to win. Text the keyword ARENA, A-R-E-N-A, ARENA, to 913-408-7957. That's ARENA to 913-408-7957. Coming up, the best Babylon B headline in quite some time before our Politics in a Pint announcement on KCMO 95.7. Just over 10 minutes, our next uh, Politics in a Pint. Our first of 2024, obviously, didn't do a ton last year with it being an off year. But we're going to be back in the saddle. A lot of Politics in a Pint's coming up this year over the next several months. So uh, be sure you're tuned in, checking them out. And it is a great event where we come out uh, with a candidate and we do a little in-person Q&A, little dinner, and a, a good time all around. So we'll announce that coming up in uh, 12 minutes here on KCMO Talk Radio. All right. Jeremy is in Kansas City. We've been talking about the stadiums, the Kansas City Star building, now looking to me like the front runner for the Royals and their new ballpark. What do you got for me, Jeremy, in Kansas City? Good morning. How you doing? Doing well, my man. What's the uh, good word? Well, uh, if you step back and think of it, nothing good has happened to the Royals since this new ownership group has taken over. Um, as far as performance of the team, the team has failed. Um, nothing against the players. I think we've got great talent. I think it's all ownership. So if tax dollars are wanting to get involved, why don't we push them to potentially get the Hunt family involved since they're wanting to potentially build a new stadium anyway? I know everybody's wanting to get away from these multi-use facilities like what we used to have in the 70s and 80s where they'd play football and baseball in the same facility. But you look at a couple of these stadiums now that have retractable roofs and the retractable fields that they slide in and out for football season. Why not do a joint venture? They have the property already. The infrastructure's already there. So here's the thing. Here's the thing, Jeremy. The the, the reason the Chiefs have already said that they just want to upgrade Arrowhead. They don't want to build a new stadium right now. Right. But potentially they want eventually want to to be able to host a Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that may be decades down the line. But, yes, I see what you're saying. I just I don't see anyone building multi-use stadiums anymore i mean is there an example anywhere in the country of any teams that are now doing joint stadiums for baseball and football because i don't think that's happening anymore no there, there, no there's not and i and i alluded to that yeah. when i brought that up that we've gone away from that but as far as you you're looking at spending more money than what the rams built spent on their new facility in a low market one of the lowest market valued baseball teams in the league. Well, no, 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 no. Now, the Rams, kind of the Ram, the Ram Stadium was five and a half billion dollars. Okay, well, we're still looking at what two and a half? No, I mean the numbers right now are two, two, two. That's with the entertainment district, which I think could be not happening. I, I think that could be, you know, going nowhere fast. So we're really talking, hopefully, about just a billion dollar stadium. Well, and why do they need to look at, you know, like you said, the entertainment district aspect of it's going nowhere fast. Why do we need an entertainment district when the only time that entertainment district is going to be viable is when there is a game? Mm -hmm. And when they fill a stadium to a quarter capacity, it's a moot point. I agree. I thank you. Yeah. It's not going to draw the people down. the entertainment district is a model that has worked in other markets. Atlanta is the one that gets a lot of attention. They built this entertainment district with a stadium in a suburban part of Atlanta, Cobb County, and it's gone gangbusters. But if the Royals want to be downtown, that doesn't make any sense. If they want it to be out in the Legends, maybe there's something there, but it doesn't make any sense downtown, especially when you have a failing power and light district. Now, I like Power and Light. I think it's a great place to hang out before concerts and big games and whatever. But 
it's failing in the sense of it doesn't make any money and the city still subsidizes it. So it is technically a failing operation. It doesn't exist without the taxpayer dollars. If you can loop the royals into that, maybe you got something. So that's uh, that's where that's at right now. Some people just, I don't know, they're hopeless. They're hopeless. It doesn't matter what side of the political aisle they're on. Um, and there's a lot of people who right now think going to war with Taylor Swift is a good idea. And uh, sad to say, there are the exact people who are going to be sitting here in a year and wondering, gosh, what happened? Lost again. Boy, we are just a bunch of losers. Must be the fault of rhinos. Fraud. No, it's just you have no idea how to message. You have absolutely no idea what you're doing. And this latest example with Taylor Swift is case in point. You know, Republicans have a problem with women voters right now. And it hasn't gotten better. In fact, it's gotten worse. Yet some people think the answer is to go after and attack the most popular pop star on the planet right now. Boy, I'll tell you, I don't know where these people get their political acumen. They're genius. Oh, boy, they are just geniuses, aren't they? I mean, wow. I, I never thought I'd meet people who are so smart and so politically savvy. And obviously I'm saying that incredibly sarcastically. You know, when you think back on the, on the Taylor Swift story, so many are getting it so wrong. When you think about the last dude that Taylor Swift dated, and I'm forgetting his name. Yeah, there you go. Which tells you a lot. Joe Alwyn. Thank you very much there. Mark, I knew you were good for that. Yeah. Uh, he was like this effeminate British actor. He was a guy who basically found himself in the forever boyfriend world, kind of the friend zone, more or less, for the better part of five or six years. And as a hopeless romantic... Taylor Swift stuck around, even as he hid their relationship. I, he, he was the ultimate soy boy beta male. And Taylor had to lead that relationship. She had to play the masculine role. And in many respects, it's why it, in part, appeared to not work. And now she finds a dude. All right, fine. He did a Pfizer commercial. Get over it. In many respects, the traditional worldview has been completely vindicated. Yet instead of celebrating that, instead of celebrating this all-American partnership, relationship that has blossomed in front of our eyes right here in Kansas City, instead of doing that, we're complaining about fake wokeness. And oh my God, oh, what is she going to do with Joe? Probably nothing. But oh, the, the fear says a lot more about those who are afraid of it and who are making up the grandiose conspiracy theories than they do about Taylor, Travis Kelsey, or anybody else involved, John. I can imagine the storyline when the left begins to eat its own, but I don't want to viva Vec and say, let's put this on record and see how it ages. Yeah. You know, but... I can imagine what might be coming if they neither say nothing about the election. Just both of them go, hey, go vote, register, mm -hmm. go vote, make sure you show up, period. And if they do that, I don't care. Right? Perfect. I don't care. But that won't be enough for the left. It might not they be. they will begin to eat on Taylor Swift. And I know what the line will be, but I'm not throwing it yes. out there yet. I'll tell you off the air and we'll mark it. Okay, that's fine. And then if we want to bring it on the air, we can do that. You know, think about this, too. Eight million new Gen Z voters are going to be joining the electorate this year. And instead of, like, meeting them where they're at and trying to convince them to vote for someone who they may not consider and, like, taking conservatism and making it fun and engaging, instead, some people are trying to basically scalp their most beloved pop star for no reason other than social media engagement. And attention for themselves. And that's what makes me think a lot of these folks, they're not serious. They don't care who actually wins because they win no matter what. See, they, they personally win. They will make money. They will have 
um, you know, they're big money donors and funders. A lot of the people who do this uh, that you follow on social media and they have some YouTube shows and things like that, they don't rely on small business being successful like we do here on KCMO. This radio station succeeds when small business owners are doing well in this town and they're getting business from people like you. That's how we succeed. We're not one of these, um, you know, big national media conglomerate voices or people that you follow on X and on YouTube and on Rumble, who many of them, you know, they don't brag about this, but they have their funders. They have billionaires who subsidize what they do. And they're all about the engagement. They're all about the attention. They're all about the clicks. In large part, winnings are relevant. Making sure small business actually does well is relevant. Now, they will say the right thing, but that's the grift. And that's why I've never seen such a loser argument and a losing proposition in my life than what I'm witnessing right now with Taylor Swift. And as the GOP continues to embarrass itself and get more to touch as the years go on, um, this is just the latest example of that. And I, and it pains me to say it. I'm not saying that out of joy. I'm not saying that because I, I, I you know, uh, don't risk pissing some people off. I do. But I'm never going to sugarcoat what I believe. And, and now you're seeing like MSNBC with this headline this morning I just put up on my social media channel. MAGA meltdown over Taylor Swift. The right is gift wrapping this issue to the left. I mean, they are putting it on a silver freaking platter for them. Way to go, geniuses. And if you can't see through it, I, you are blind to what is happening right now. 913-408-7957. That's our studio line. That's our text line. Alex, Ali, excuse me, is in Overland Park. Hello, Ali. Good morning. Hey, um... This is, yeah, this is Alice, but that's fine. So, Pete, I couldn't agree with you more about all this stuff because I feel like we saw it with Trump. The more Trump was attacked, the more people started to support him. And I feel like that's a natural kind of underdog position that people want to take is when you see somebody who's being attacked, you kind of want to come to their defense and say, well, maybe that's not so fair. And I think that, to your point exactly, the Republicans are really screwing this up because they, they just don't need to say anything. That's the point. You just don't need to say anything because most people, the vast majority of people, especially Republicans, will say that they want their their political stuff, their entertainment, their sports separate. They don't want it intertwined in any way. And so by drawing more attention to it, it only creates more of this like pressure for whether it's political people or the entertainer to somehow respond. And I hope, I hope that Taylor Swift and I don't think Travis Kelsey would say anything because that's just not his deal. But I, I hope that she just stays silent and just recognizes that, you know, this is just whatever's happening in this election cycle. She's in a new place with a new relationship, and it's probably best to just leave it alone. Mm-hmm. And not to mention, like, half the people who are supporting this relationship live in the Midwest. Yeah. Which, overwhelmingly are going to be a little bit more Republican leaning people. Yeah. And to your point, women as well. So it's yeah. like, I don't know. I don't understand who's telling who to say anything about this. I think it's just a really stupid thing to do. You're right, Alex. Thank you. Well said on all fronts. And um, they are completely misplaying their hand. Coming up, I got some data that I want to share with you on uh, backing up exactly what Alex just said. There's, there's so much under the hood here that can be looked at from a data perspective that is so, um, it's the best way to put this. It just will reiterate the point I'm making because obviously I, I feel the way I feel. Alex does as well. If you disagree, 913-408-7957. We'll take your call as well. I'm not sitting here looking for people to affirm what I believe. Um, We'll line them up here for the next 15 minutes on KCMO Talk Radio. But the data also suggests there's no benefit to her on this. And it also suggests people who are freaking out and afraid of this, they don't even know what they're talking about. I've got those numbers. I'll share them with you coming up on 95.7 FM KCMO Talk Radio. And you can stream us as well on the iHeart or TuneIn app. On the text line at 820, good morning. Another beautiful day. 
across Kansas City. Going to hit 60. Good morning, Pete. Is the right really making an issue of Taylor Swift? Or is the left trying to bait us into creating an issue of Taylor Swift? It's a good question. The answer is a little bit of both. The answer is uh, there are members or folks who would call themselves uh, Republicans and conservatives and things of that nature who are big on social media. Uh, A lot of folks tied to, you know, organizations like Turning Point and things like that. And then, of course, people like Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, who are convinced that this is some grandiose conspiracy where Taylor and Travis are doing this and it's pretend and then it's all about coming out in the fall and giving Joe the big boost to get him across the finish line. Now, is it a party platform issue? Of course not. Uh, No, it's not. But some very influential people made it a thing. And now it's running rampant in certain circles. I saw this. uh, It was Scott Walker, of all people. I mean, Scott Walker, the old uh, governor of Wisconsin who ran for president back in 2015. Like, people like him are jumping on board with this. He tweeted out yesterday, funny how liberals are interested in the opinion of a white man living in the 1% who does work for Big Pharma and uh, businesses accused of using sweatshops. And it was a girlfriend who was going to fly around the world in a private jet to watch him play a game. And then he writes, happy to live rent free in the heads of liberals all over America. Uh, Bro, I think you got it backwards. Pretty sure Travis and Taylor are living rent free in your head. With nothing but assumptions and accusations that are completely baseless in any honest analysis. And Scott Walker thinks that he's living rent-free in the head of the left when really Travis and Taylor are living rent-free in his head for no reason whatsoever. Instead of just saying, hey, here's two good-looking people that happen to be dating each other. Wow, we've never seen that before between a superstar athlete and a pop star. Wow, wow, first time that's ever happened, right? Um, instead of looking at it like that and just kind of rolling with it, it's some grandiose plan of, oh, boy, they're going to come out against us. Yeah, GOP is a female problem. I know what we should do. Let's attack Taylor Swift <laughs> for something uh, you know that she did f- four to six years ago because she might do it again, even though there's no evidence to suggest she's going to do it again. Brilliant, brilliant strategy. Glenn's in Kansas City. What's up, Glenn? Morning, Pete. Uh, go Chiefs! There you I go, brother. Out. Sorry. It's all good. Um, but um, Republicans, one thing they're really, really good at is shooting themselves in the foot. Oh, yeah, they're great. They don't need help. They don't need help. Just let it go. Shut up. It'll blow away. Yeah. You don't have to comment on everything. You don't have to get involved on everything. No matter how stupid it is, just let it go. Just let it go. And I'm sorry to say I'm a Trump supporter, but he suffers big time from this, too. Mm -hmm. He cannot shut up. I think somebody in his crew, uh, they all have the emperor has no clothes syndrome. They're afraid to tell him whatever. Like when he went after Nikki, he's going to win it. Shut up, Trump. Live your life. Run your, you know, campaign. Don't go after her personally. What does he do after the last one? He goes after her personally. She collects a million bucks. You talking and about Nikki? Yeah, you're talking about Nikki. No, I Nikki got you. Haley, yeah, yep. yeah. All right, Glenn. Good deal, my man. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're, you're, listen, you're spot on. But to Trump's credit, he hasn't said anything about this Taylor Swift stuff. Remember, the one thing Trump said publicly about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey is he wished him well on his Truth Social account back in, like, October. And he made some joke about, you know, hey, Travis, you know, watch your back, buddy, or something like that. Like, but he's got to tell people in his orbit to shut up about this. That's what he's got to do. He's been, you know, he hasn't made a peep about this whole thing. He's just got to tell the people in his orbit to shut up about this. Because there's no way to win out of it. Now, when you look at the data, just on the data points here, Taylor Swift in uh, last year tried to get people registered to vote. And she got 35,000 people registered to vote out of 280 million Instagram followers. That is nothing. This is nothing to even be afraid of. 
And if you are afraid of it, if you are afraid of her, it says more about how you perceive your own candidate and your own platform than it does anything else. Jonathan's in Overland Park next up. What's up, Jonathan? Good morning. How you doing? Doing well, brother. What's happening? I mean, I, I think I agree with a lot of these callers. I think Republicans, a lot of these, some of these Republicans who are making this a big deal are making this a deal where it doesn't need to be a big deal. You know, Taylor Swift, she endorsed, I don't know if you remember Phil Bredesen, the former governor of Tennessee, who won, like, I think every single county a decade ago in the 2000s or whatever, mm-hmm. 2010s. And she endorses him, and the guy, and I remember there was a Time Magazine article, oh, my goodness, it's going to make all the difference. Time he Magazine. ends up losing in a landslide to Marsha Blackburn, and Marsha's probably safe re-election this year. Yeah. And she's one of the best senators. And so I think, you know, this whole while she's going to move the needle. You know what? I think with Trump and Biden, everybody's mind is made up. Like, what what is a celebrity going to tell you that you haven't already thought about with these two candidates the last yeah. 15 years that they've run? Yeah. It's not going to move the needle. It didn't do it for Hillary. It's not going to do it for them. Yeah, I'll never forget. Well said, Jonathan. Hillary, you know, the night before the 2016 election with Springsteen, and I love Bruce, um, she was up there with Springsteen in Philly and Beyonce. And what did that do? Didn't even win Pennsylvania. So the left is now using the right, some on the right, stupid commentary to try to pressure Taylor into doing something on their behalf. And doesn't it reek of desperateness that they're trying to get Taylor involved nine, ten months out? Like they're showing their cards by trying to get Taylor involved in an election with ten months to go. It says a lot more about them. And once again, it's being completely missed on the other side of the aisle. Brandon's in Kansas City. Hey, Brandon, good morning. Hey, uh, don't you just think that this is a bunch of uh, NFL rigged guys that are can't explain why their team keeps losing to the Chiefs, so they think <laughs> it has to be some conspiracy theory against them? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't, nothing would surprise me anymore, Brandon. I think we are getting to that point where the Chiefs are, you know, they're becoming obviously the new dynasty, And people want to basically look at every little thing as some kind of grand conspiracy theory. Uh, That's my take on it. I think it's just salty fans that don't understand that they're not as good as the Chiefs. I I can appreciate that, Brandon. Well done. I I think there's something to that, my man. (laughs) Glad we're mostly on the same page. I can't say that for the text line or my social medias or my emails I woke up to today. They weren't so nice. But, you know, that's okay. I'm a big boy. I can take it. It's all good. It's all good.